So um, we've defined and studied the properties of the labor demand and labor supply curves in our two market uh, model of Slack. Now let's move. So these are the two key curves uh, to study the labor market. Now let's move to the product market and study the two key curves uh, there. And these two curves will be the aggregate supply curves and the aggregate demand curve. Uh, so let's start with the aggregate supply curve. <coughs> Um, so what's the aggregate supply curve? What does it give? Well, it gives um, the number um, of services that are actually um, sold given uh, uh, given the capacity given the capacity of firms and the matching um, process. So this is, um, you know, the labor supply gives us the number of workers who end up employed, given labor force participation, the matching process. So this is the equivalent of that labor supply curve on the um, product market. So number of services sold given the capacity of firms and uh, the matching process. And so uh, what's the expression for aggregate supply curve? So uh, we'll denote it Y because it's an output, S because it's a supply. So it's going to depend on X, the product market tightness. That's obvious because it's going to determine how many services are actually sold. <coughs> um, but we'll see that it's also going to depend on other variables. So I'm going to uh, let that open like this. So number of services that are sold given the capacity of firms. So we can write it as f of x times uh, k. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so f of x here, that's our selling probability. k, this is the capacity of firms. So we can write our aggregate supply curve as a function of both capacity and uh, product market tightness. Um, so that, that's uh, that's the first step. Then you know, of course, the capacity of firms that depend. You know, you can write it as a, a function of the number of producers that firms uh, have. Uh, through the production function. Um, and of course, that production function, you know, uh, is always um, valid here. So if we uh, use the production function for firms, what we get is that ys is going to become a function of x. And now we can replace our capacity by uh, n, so number of producers in firm, and then what, we, what we're going to get is A, which is technology level, f of x times n alpha. Uh, so here I've used the production function for firms that says that k capacity is A technology times n number of producer alpha diminishing marginal returns to labor. Um, so we can write the aggregate supply curve uh, as uh, follows. So that gives us, uh, so here we show that it's going to depend not only on technology, but it's also going to depend on the selling probability and the number of producers. Now, given the cost of um, posting vacancies, um, as well as the matching process, we know that the uh, number of producers is actually, which is N here, or I could have flagged that, this is technology, and, and here is the number of producers. So given the matching cost and given the matching function, we also know uh, we also know that we can express the number of producers as a, to, as a function of the total number of employees. Um,
So given the matching cost and the matching function, we know that n, the number of producers, is just l, the number of employees, um, divided by 1 plus tau of theta, tau hat of theta, where tau hat of theta is a matching wedge. And so this allows, uh, this allows us to rewrite the aggregate supply as a function of product market tightness, but also labor market tightness, and l uh, employment. And so it's going to be a f of x l 1 plus star hat of theta to the power of alpha. So this uh, links a great supply to the two tightnesses and l, the, uh, which is a quick key quantity from uh, coming out of, uh, of the labor market. And this is just using our definition of the aggregate supply and you know key um, static relationship, the production function, which is of course valid, always valid, and the link between the matching cost and the matching function. Um, so this is our aggregate supply. Um, so uh, we can see a couple of results um, that are interesting here. Uh, so first of all, you can see that it depends uh, not only on product market tightness, but also on the labor market tightness, because the labor market tightness will tell us for a given level of employment, how many producers there are, and therefore what the capacity of firms uh, is going to be. Um, but a couple of things that we can see. So we can see that the aggregate supply when product market tightness is zero is going to be zero. That's because the selling probability F when X is zero is zero. So if you know you cannot sell anything, the aggregate supply will uh, go to zero. Um, you can also see uh, that the aggregate supply when the labor market tightness is theta M, that's going to be equal to zero. That's because tau hat of theta equal theta m, that's zero. So when the market is very is so tight that, uh, sorry, that's, um, that's infinite. When the market is so tight that the matching wage is infinite, there are no producers, and so your aggregate supply becomes zero. Um, in, in general, another thing that we can see is that uh, the aggregate supply is uh, increasing in x, the so product market tightness, because f is increasing in X. So, um, so when the product market is tighter, the selling probability is higher. Um, you know, it's easier for firms to sell their good. And as a result, the aggregate supply will be uh, increasing. You can see that on the other end, the aggregate supply is decreasing uh, at least as defined here, uh, take you know, if we take uh, employment as given, then of course the aggregate supply is going to be decreasing in uh, labor market tightness. And that's because here, uh, tau hat, the matching wedge, is increasing in tightness. Now, of course, another issue is that when the labor market um, is tighter, there is more employment. And so these two things are going to be a bit moving in opposite direction. That's similar to the argument we made with the aggregate demand in the basic model when, um, so when the product market tightness was higher, the matching wedge was higher, so it's high, it more difficult to buy goods, and so that tends to depress aggregate demand, but of course, um, income goes up also. Um, so you know, you had this kind of uh, two elements when we are looking at the aggregate demand, the basic model. We later kind of try to clean up a bit uh, both aggregate supply and aggregate demand to isolate different effects uh, that may be at play. But at least here in this expression, that's what uh, these are the, this is what we find. And of course, here, as formulated here, of course, the aggregate supply is increasing is um, increasing in L. Uh, so when you have more employment, you'll have a bigger aggregate supply. That's just because then, uh, for you increase the capacity of firms. Um, Um, and so here you can also see a little bit where the interaction, uh, one interaction between the product market and the labor market is going to happen is that um, in the same way that the labor demand depended 
both on product market tightness and labor market tightness. So that was a bridge through which you would have interaction between the two markets. Here, our aggregate supply depends not only on product market tightness, but also labor market tightness and employment, uh, which are both determined on the labor market. So you can see that the aggregate supply will also act as a bridge between labor market and product market. Yeah. Okay, so this is for our aggregate supply curve. Now let's look at the uh, aggregate demand curve. So the aggregate demand curve is going to be um, the number of services <coughs> that households um, would like to purchase. You know, given, of course, uh, tightness and prices. Prices, okay, and so this, of course, this is determined, this is to maximize their utility. So what is going to be our uh, aggregate demand here? What we know uh, from our previous analysis is that in the basic model, the, when the household maximizes utility, what they are going to do is that they are going to uh, spend a fraction, you know, what's optimal is to spend a fraction of um, your initial uh, endowment of um, wealth plus income. Uh, so you take your all your labor income, you take your initial amount of wealth, and it's optimal to spend a, a fraction of that. That fraction, that's what we had called the marginal propensity to spend. We had denoted it um, sigma, and uh, we had an expression for that. So what we saw is that the, uh, so the optimal quantity that households would like to purchase, it's sigma x times income <coughs> plus um, endowment of uh, real wealth, which is mu over p. Okay, so, and this was MPS, the marginal propensity to spend. And furthermore, we had an expression for this marginal propensity to spend that was key, the utility parameter, the power of epsilon, One plus tau x one plus key epsilon one plus tau x and this was to the power of epsilon minus one. And this this is an uh, endowment of real wealth. So here, um, I just double checked. Here we have a slight typo. So it's not epsilon minus one, it's one minus epsilon. Yes, okay. One minus epsilon here, one minus epsilon. So that's what we had showed, uh, that's what we had showed earlier. So now the question is, uh, what is the uh, household's income here? So income so that's going to be two things. It's going to be um, labor income. 
So of course, um, households now, uh, they work in firms and so they'll get some income from that. But on top of it, firms make profits and we'll assume that firms are owned by households. So we also have, uh, we also have firms' uh, profits that are going to be rebated, uh, that are rebated to households. Okay, uh, so now we can uh, give expression for this thing. So here also I should have said, um, so how much the households want to spend, it's going to be marginal propensity to spend time nominal income, but how many uh, services the household want to purchase, that's going to be marginal propensity to spend time real income. So this is here I have real uh, wealth and here it's key that I have real income. Uh, okay, so I could also rewrite it by multiplying everything by P and have an amount of nominal wealth, nominal income, as well as a nominal expenditure. But here I'm focusing on number of services that the household want to buy. So that's why I need real income, real wealth. So real income is going to be the real labor income. So what's our real labor income? Uh, it's the real, wa it's a real wage times uh, employment by the households. And that's just uh, what we've called L plus firm profits. So what are firms profits? And so again, here these are what I, what we need are firms real profits. Um, so real profits, so we can uh, look at nominal profits. So nominal profit, it's going to be um, P, the price of services times um, why the amount of services that are sold minus so nom so here i'm looking at nominal profit so we have nominal revenue minus nominal cost which is w the nominal wage times l the number of employees and that includes both producers and recruiters and then because i'm focusing on real profits i have to divide all of this by p okay so if i rewrite this so i have w over p times l plus y minus W over P times L. And so, of course, the real income of the household, given everything is just going to be the revenue of the firm. Uh, and here we can see they are going to get it either through their labor income or through profits. So this is going to be uh, Y. Um, but of course, that real income, so it's how much uh, firms are able to sell, but that's just basically it's going to be given by uh, how much they sell we know what it is. It's going to be f of x, the probability to sell, times k, the capacity, uh, the capacity of the firm. Okay. Uh, so this is the real income. And so here we can plug that back into our expression over there for the aggregate demand. And so we get that our aggregate demand yd, it's just sigma x times f of x times k plus mu over p. And so you recognize here, this is exactly the same expression as in the basic model. So the fact that the income comes from different sources that you have a firm actually doesn't change anything. This is exactly what we had uh, what we had in the previous uh, in the previous basic model where there was only one market. Um, and so of course f of x times k you recognize this is also our aggregate supply and so it, it's possible you know to rewrite the aggregate supply in uh, in various ways. Uh, and then it's possible to plug that back into this aggregate demand. Uh, but so far, yeah, so far that's not necessary to do that. Uh, we don't really need to do that here. So aggregate demand.
So here, what I've, uh, what I've given here, this is what I'd called earlier when we looked at the basic model, this is a behavioral aggregate demand in that uh, it, it, well, more than reflect, it gives uh, households desire, households desired uh, purchases. And then what we can do is that once, and, but you can see here, uh, here you can see that basically you have the aggregate supply that shows up here because the aggregate supply gives uh, the in, gives the um, income of uh, our household. And so what we'll be able to do later when we solve the model is that we'll be able to define a pure aggregate demand, which um, basically substitute out uh, the aggregate supply element. And so we'll see at least, you know, once we put together all the equations that define the model, we'll be able to substitute out the aggregate supply part here and have a pure aggregate demand. Um, but nevertheless, it's always true that the behavioral aggregate demand, which says how much households want to purchase, uh, is going to be given by this expression. And, and here we can see is that it, uh, it of course mixes uh, this aggregate demand involves the aggregate supply uh, because the aggregate supply determines the household's income and that's just basically that's just say as we had said before that says law which says that supply creates its own demand is partly present here and supply creates partly uh, its own demand partly because of course the marginal propensity to spend the sick bag that we have here is uh, strictly less than one. Um, if we had says low, supply would just be equal to demand. But here it's attenuated thanks because we've assumed that real wealth centers the utility function, which gives, them, gives us a non-degenerate aggregate demand curve, as we, had, as we had discussed before. So for now, it's just good to know what um, this behavioral aggregate demand is, and that will already help us a lot um, solving the model.